Hey guys, welcome to the prelude of episode four of Invest With Instinct. I just thought I'd hop on here and explain our next guest, switching it up a little bit from trading and investing and going into the poker world. He's a good friend of mine. He's a professional poker player, poker vlogger, sponsored ambassador for the World Poker Tour, and just all around really kind of creative, cool person. So he's somebody who has invested completely in themselves and has built a personal brand and a life around it. And that's kind of where the discussion goes today. You're gonna have to bar with me. There were a couple of uh, technical difficulties. I've been trying to use this new um, platform to record on that should make the quality of these even better, but had a little trouble. I'm gonna try to make some wizardry happen in the editing room and make it seem not too bad. Um, otherwise, hope you enjoy it and just a little bit something different. You all might take something away from it. Enjoy. All right, guys, welcome back. Invest with Instinct, episode number four. Um, come to find out, number four is this man's favorite number. Um, I don't know, some of you might recognize who this guy is. Longtime friend, Andrew Nimi. And um, I'm going to just give him the floor for a one minute elevator pitch. Just run through your who you are and where you're at now currently and then we'll we'll get past that uh I'm, I'm a michigan boy now in las vegas and uh in between all that was uh about a decade or a little bit less of uh professional poker playing and grinding uh mostly here in las vegas in the live poker realm uh eight years into that i started a youtube channel that was dedicated towards the live poker uh, lifestyle and um, some some surrounding visuals in Las Vegas and elsewhere. And uh, six or so years after that led to a partnership with the World Poker Tour, as well as ownership of a card club in Austin, Texas, that I am uh, part of the, uh, the group of uh, my fellow owners. And uh, that has been a fun project as well. Yeah, that's crazy. And kind of, I've uh, known you long enough to kind of see these all like the story arc progress. And it's it's pretty yep. cool. And that's actually why I wanted to bring you on because I'm still trying to figure out how to how to exactly say what, what this podcast is. But in general, it's bringing people on that are I, more often will be investors, traders that have figured out who they are as like an authentic version of themselves when it comes to investing and trading and how kind of staying in their own lane and not trying to act like other people that have different risk profiles, different time horizons, different mentalities, um, and really like kind of settling into who they are. Um, but as we know, poker and trading have like a gazillion crossovers. They're essentially the same thing in a weird way. And um, I thought it'd be cool with you because not only have you spent time in the poker world, obviously, but you've kind of gone all in on investing in yourself, right? Um, you've kind of taken the leap and been like, all right, Andrew Nimi is now, is the brand, is the effort, is the career. Um, and like you said, it's, it's kind of branched into a bunch of different things. Um, but how has like the idea of building your own personal brand, like changed the way over time that you view poker as your career, as your goal, um, how has that kind of morphed over time to where you are today? Yeah, well, there was definitely like a big morph process um, when you go from just grinding poker full time to when you decide to start a YouTube channel uh, all on your own, editing your own videos, uh, you know, starring in it, coming up with creative ideas and process because that is uh, very time consuming. Whereas like most poker players, uh, almost all poker players are doing nothing of the sort. They are definitely putting in tons of work. Uh, a lot of that is off the table, but it's uh, very much in the form of studying poker, uh, you know, using tools, developing ranges, uh, all those sorts of things that a professional poker player has to nail down if they want to be successful. Um, so to take time away from that endeavor, as well as time away from the poker table itself and, uh, sit at your laptop uh, for 10 or 12 or 15 hours and editing a, a single YouTube video. That's a pretty big, that's a pretty big shift. Um, and I, I don't think I realized exactly how much work uh, each video was going to be at the time of, uh, of starting a YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, in poker, you're just, you're just very much like uh, on that grind mission. Um, and a lot of it is out of your control. 
in terms of like how it's gonna how it's gonna play out, what your personal brand is gonna look like. Um, for for a long while in poker, it was kind of it was definitely easier. Um, like in the boom days, we refer to you know in the, uh, the early to mid two thousands when basically poker was all over television all the time, um, and the online poker sites they were basically looking for different characters to to find and to develop and they would get them wherever they could find them. So basically you run deep at a poker tournament, uh, especially a big one like uh, say the WSOP main event uh, or any tournament that's on television back then, chances are you were gonna be able to have an opportunity for one of these poker sites to develop you into a character. Um, so they would give you a sponsorship and the, their, their branding mechanism would be working for you uh, in your favor. Over time, that kind of went away. Um, there became, you know, less opportunities like that. Uh, poker wasn't on television quite as much or nearly as much as it was back then. And so you were sort of like, you know, left up to your own devices in the poker world itself, whether it meant like, you know, grinding your way up to super high stakes cash games uh, and maybe getting a, uh, an appearance on one of the remaining sh poker shows like high stakes poker, for example, um, or you win a tournament uh, like at the World Poker Tour and they would have their own television product, which you would then be uh, appearing on and then hope to develop that into a personal brand. Those things, those uh, those are both very difficult to achieve and there's only a tiny sliver of, uh, of people that are going to get, be able to experience that. Um, and you really have to be an elite player in order to achieve that. Um, so I thought there would be like an opportunity to create content that was uh, sort of, I think missing in the, uh, the poker landscape um, at the time that I started my channel, as well as like, just, you know, build, build out my own space, build my own brand and, uh, you know, develop, develop around that basically. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a really interesting time to like go into that. Right. I mean, when, like at what point you, you started, I think if I recall correctly, it was more of like a creative endeavor. Maybe you saw an opportunity as like, you know, a business sense, but only in a very small fashion down the road. Like when did, when did that transition to the point where like, you were like, Oh, maybe I should like, you know, actually kind of put a lot more effort into that. Like what was the feedback that you got from the community that like, wh where all of a sudden there was like this chasm that was crossed where you're like, Oh, like this is a channel that I could actually kind of split off and I could have my, my poker career. And then I have my content kind of, career that's just burgeoning like when, yeah. when did that happen like wh what was that kind of moment yeah for for me in particular uh for poker content it's kind of like a, a special niche um of of content because the people who you know the content landscape the poker landscape i'd say it's relatively small and it's kind of niche um you know when compared to like mass market um, you know, you, there's many people that are familiar with lots of different YouTubers, like say the Jake Pauls of the world, you know, those guys are well known, uh, across many different segments of, uh, of our population, um, people consuming poker content, it was, you know, certainly far more niche than, uh, something like that would be. But the thing with the poker content, uh, and the audience that consumes it is that they're so passionate about poker and about poker content that they want to consume so much of it that is out there. So uh, not only that, but they also want to like share it with their friends, their fellow poker playing friends and talk about it, you know, whether it's drama or it's, uh, you know, gossip or it's like poker study. Um, if somebody finds something that's interesting or just poker hands, you know, like a crazy hand that happened, people want to share that. And so it sort of makes its way around the poker community relatively quickly. Um, so, you know, going back to the early days, did I envision lots of these different twists and turns uh, that have happened since then. Definitely not. There was a lot of stuff that would have just been impossible to envision, like the uh, card club in Austin, for example. Um, but there's definitely like some... Shout out to the Lodge. Shout out to the Lodge. The Lodge in uh, Round Rock, Texas, suburb of Austin. Uh, but there was definitely like some, you know, super best case scenarios in my mind, having seen some of these mainstream YouTubers do their thing. Uh, you actually introduced me to Casey Neistat in the first place. Uh, I think you were watching him for like six months or a year before I even knew he was, uh, that he existed. So I very much saw what he was up to. Um, and he also like explained what he was up to very well and the reasons why he was doing it, 
And that definitely resonated with me in a lot of ways, um, as, as he did with who knows how many thousands, tens of thousands of people that started a YouTube, YouTube channel because of him. Um, so yeah, I, I thought that there would be some possibilities to, for it to lead into something, but you hear about all of the difficulties that YouTubers have when they start a channel and how difficult it is to like get traction, um, or make money off of the platform. Um, but yeah, like me going into it, I was already, uh, not an extremely successful poker player, but I was a profitable poker player out there in the grind playing my five, 10 games at the Bellagio. And I felt like, you know, my response to people saying, you know, it's going to be really hard starting a YouTube channel and having that like be fruitful. My response to that was, well, I'm already like making some money playing poker. Um, it's going to be a little bit different from some other people that are, you know, just starting from scratch and, and looking at this as solely a money-making endeavor. So just decided to try it and see where, see where uh, it might go and see how the first video might do and, and iterate from there maybe. Yeah. And uh, I mean, to be fair, the niche at the time is, well, first of all, it's huge now, like comparatively to what it was, it's, it's massive now. And if at every table, there's probably like one person that's probably, probably done a vlog or something of their poker game <laughs> at some point. But um, at the time, it was taking a risk in a sense of like, you know, putting yourself out there, you didn't really know what you're going to get back. Um, but the, the reason that yours took off was uh, twofold. One, I think you kind of struck it at the right time. Um, that that was kind of, be I don't know if it was becoming a thing or you, I like to say you kind of made it a thing, but there was um, an air of Andrew acting like himself, uh, you know, and that's again, comes back to the core of this show is that like um, authenticity often like uh, attracts people to that. And I feel like that was probably one of the reasons that your uh, channel and your effort took off because you were able to really like, be like, Hey, man, like, I'm a I'm a poker player in Las Vegas, and I'm going to show you how it's like, and then we're going to go drink a beer after and it's, it's going to be exactly how I live my, my life. Would you say that um, that happened quickly for you? And then we'll touch base on like, how, a little bit more about like, how it's maybe helped you become even a better poker player. But like, how did that transition into um, being comfortable with yourself on, on camera and to the people to make it like, this is me showing myself me to you? Did, did that come pretty naturally to you for being uh, a kind of shyer guy from what I recall? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've always, there was not just you. There was like many people that were shocked to find out that I was like, uh, a putting myself out there, B that I even had a voice. Uh, I've always been like one of the most quiet people at the poker table itself. And so I like to say that I, um, and I find it a lot easier to express myself through, through the vids and through editing and through music selection and drone shots and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, going back to like the start of it, um, shout out to the trooper. He was out there, uh, a guy named Tim, Tim Watts. Uh, he was making some videos around YouTube or around Las Vegas on YouTube. And, uh, you know, he was, he was playing poker, um, and he was like very much himself in his videos. He was doing that for at least a couple of years before I was, uh, you know, he was very much himself. He would, coffee was always his thing. Um, so yeah, just like, thought, you know, that's, that's cool. Um, where I'm obviously like very different from he is. Um, so maybe I can like showcase what I'm up to, uh, show my perspective on this poker thing and this Las Vegas thing, go play some cards, talk about some hands, do like a, a deeper dive into you know, the, uh, the street by street process of a, of a poker hand flop turn river, what I was thinking at the time, and then, uh, do that five or six times, uh, and then go grab a, like you said, go grab a beer around Vegas at some of my favorite, uh, bars, this, this city I've been living in for eight years now, show people some of my favorite, uh, local spots. People love getting recommendations from locals, um, whatever city it might be, but especially Las Vegas, I think. Um, and package that all together. So yeah, I definitely agree. Like, um, being, being your authentic self, um, it's, it's like exhausting. This whole thing is like, it, it's, it's very time consuming. It's very, it can be very tiresome. It can be, it takes up a lot of mind share. So like, that's just being yourself. I can't imagine like trying to be a character and doing all that stuff and like keeping up, yeah, keeping up the visuals, 
of, of that at the same time, that would just be like, I don't, I don't know how you could do that for too long. I think you would just burn out. Um, so it's much easier uh, to just do your, do your own thing and be yourself and like show people what, uh, what is really going on in your mind and what, how you see things through your, through your own eyes. Yeah. And I think that that's from just even the video content sense, but when, when thinking about playing poker or, uh, making a trade or making an investment, like if you were trying to put up the act or put on the character of like playing, I, I got, I got caught up in this in poker too. Like I wanted to be a certain type of poker player, even though not, it wasn't necessarily, I think to my core who I wanted to be, right. I wanted to be table captain. I wanted people to think I was good. I wanted that, I wanted that like respect from other peers. And I think in the end, I look back and I'm like that it was not only exhausting because of the stress that came with trying to like keep playing an inauthentic style of poker. And it was just, you wouldn't really realize it, but I think it was like a, like the Chinese water drip of mistakes over and over in small, <laughs> medium sized pots and not willing to admit that maybe this isn't this isn't like who I am, how I want to approach things or what, what's best. Maybe it's who I like kind of aspired to be, but like, yeah. there's, there's a difference. Like, was I willing to work to become that type of player? Like there's a, there's a giant gap there and I wasn't, I wasn't willing to do that. And, uh, you know, hold on, let me see if I, my camera just stopped there for a second. Okay. We had some tough technical difficulties. This is clearly, uh, like Andrew said, episode four type of problems, and we are trying out a new streaming service. So hopefully, hopefully we can make this work. Um, I was just referring to back in the day, not playing like the person I felt I should actually probably be playing like. So um, one thing I want to ask you is, first of all, uh, how did you deal with that in, in general in poker, like back then, now, whatever? And did doing this content and this having this other kind of stratospheric thing take off allow you to actually play more authentic poker because you didn't feel maybe the pressure to change your game or do anything else to try and make more money as other income streams started coming about does that question make sense yeah i mean it's tough for me to know like exactly what you were feeling and what you felt like you needed to be doing and where like whatever disconnect was there um, you know, for you as well, obviously whatever happened worked out, uh, about as good as I could have. So like, maybe you just weren't willing to like grind it out. Um, maybe you wanted to like play faster and make things happen faster. And maybe that was like, you know, pushing it a little bit too much in, uh, in live poker where you sort of like some, a lot of times you gotta, you gotta let things come to you at the poker table. Um, you know, so maybe that was the case. Tough, tough to know exactly. Um, again, there's, there's also like not, not a ton of like data collection that goes on in live poker. Uh, like there is an online poker, for example. Um, but for me to like speak to my own experiences and uh, feelings, um, and this is something I've been thinking about lately a lot is that I don't think I was ever really, you know, like the most competitive person out there, uh, whether that is in poker um, or in like sports when I was growing up as a kid, um, you know, I played different sports, uh, and I think one by one, those sort of like fell to the wayside. I didn't mind like, you know, playing catch with my buddies and stuff, but like come to little league baseball, I didn't really want to like get up there and go to bat. It just wasn't really my vibe or my speed. And so, you know, I got into poker because I liked the, uh, you know, the, the do it yourself, kind of like carve your own path nature of, uh, of the endeavor. Um, but poker can be, you know, one of the most competitive endeavors that there is. And so, you know, over time, I was able to able to sort of, you know, carve out a, an OK uh, uh, income stream for myself from the game, uh, from just grinding. But it was never like I was playing super high level, both like, uh, you know, from uh, a a game, like a game theory perspective, or, you know, the actual level of stakes that we were playing again, playing five, 10, no limit of the Bellagio. A lot of people, a lot of like casual poker players would be like, Oh yeah, you're just, you're making it, you know, that's, that's great. But you know, we weren't exactly like just absolutely killing it, uh, in that game. So, um, yeah. So like for me, it was, I think it was like more of just a natural 
step for my non-competitive, more creative self to, to find YouTube, uh, and, and like, you know, package something, make something and put it together. You know, I'll say it's tangible, even though it's a digital form, um, you know, it has something at the end of the day. And then of course there's like all these, uh, creative elements that go into that, whether it's like sh shot selection or, uh, finding music to fit the vibe of that video. Um, all those things that like your, your true competitors in the poker field are just absolutely not doing at all in, in their own endeavor. Um, so yeah, like I think both of us kind of eventually landed more in a, uh, a space that, uh, that spoke to them in, in, in whatever fashion. So do you actually think in a weird way you got more competitive at all when it came to the content creation, knowing that you had, I would, I don't know if you call it like an advantage, but you were doing things other people weren't doing and you kind of were able to grow an audience. Were you able to get competitive in that way at all? Or were you just still kind of like abundance, rising tide lifts all boats. This is cool. That's cool. Whatever. Uh, I think from the start, like I, I sort of knew pretty quickly that it was going to be tough for anybody else to really do like put together the kinds of videos that I was putting together. Um, just like, I don't know, just like a weird, it, it had this, I felt like it had this sort of like special combination. Like I was in Vegas, I was playing five ten. I knew my way around that game. I knew my way around Vegas. Um, I feel like I had a really clear picture, like I said, like what Casey Neistat was up to and why he was doing it and being able to like connect with the audience. You know, the cool thing about YouTube is that you don't need to ask permission. Um, you can just make something, you upload it, you can build your your uh, your platform and grow your audience and you can connect with the audience directly. So, you, you know, back in the day, you had to get uh, greenlit through, uh, um, you know, through a studio. Um, and so I understood like, that aspect of it you could just you know be your own mercenary and get things done um and you know to like to start to start that takes a long time to like you know you, you ask questions of yourself for like six months should i should i try this thing i don't know uh, i tell my wife boosie i think i need to start a vlog you know and then it's three months later baby i think i need to start a vlog and she's like yeah you should start one and then Another month later, yeah, I think I should start a vlog. So finally, like pulling the trigger and getting yourself over that um, and then like figuring things out and just, yeah. So like for a while, it was like going to be really tough for anybody to like uh, catch up to this thing um, that I had started doing. And there's definitely like some first mover advantage to that um, as there is in many other things. And then, yeah, for a long time, um, almost like almost the entire time I've been doing this thing, I've been in the mindset that it's much more collaborative than it is competitive. Um, because uh, it's a little bit different from like streaming, for example, when you only really want to watch one live stream and you want to watch it while it's live. Um, going back to watch a live stream loses a little bit of that element of this person is doing that right now and I'm watching it as it's happening. Mm -hmm. So you can only do that for one person at a time. Um, whereas YouTube videos, you know, you can watch a 10 minute video, you can watch a five minute video, then you can watch another 10 minute video and you can have your different people that you follow on different days and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I definitely was, uh, and in a lot of ways still am very much in that rising tide lifts all boats kind of a, kind of a thing. Um, even though like, I, I definitely didn't need to worry about any sort of competitive aspect to it. Um, it's only when you really want to like start dabbling in, you know, the monetization of things, um, because the people that you want to partner with in that regard, they're going to have like a limited spend for their budget and they want to make sure that that budget is you know, in the, it's, it's budgeted appropriately in their eyes. Um, and so you're sort of in that regard, you are sort of competing with the other people that might like to, uh, land a sponsorship of some sort, and then competing for how many dollars, uh, how much percentage share of that budget you're going to be able to get for yourself. So yeah, once you decide to go that route, um, there is some competitive elements to it, but you know, as far as like growing the audience, um, I think that's less competitive than, uh, than a lot of other endeavors. Yeah. And I think there's for people that like, like for me, it's funny when you say the whole like three month thing, three month thing, that's, yeah, that's like life in a nutshell right there, just uh, of actually creating things. But one thing I've always noticed with content is 
the idea that every time you actually publish something, you feel in a weird way, even if it doesn't get you anywhere, it feels like you're going somewhere. Like it feels like uh, you're, you've taken a step in a direction at least where in the, in the realm of trading and poker, it's like a repetitive, you know, carousel of doing the same thing over and over. And often you end up sitting with yourself on a Tuesday night, wondering what it's all for. And there's, oh, a, yeah. <laughs> and there's a cool thing about creative pursuits. And even if you're into crypto and you know, you wanted to do some NFT thing, or maybe you're into AI and there's all these, you know, new innovative ways, there's the first mover advantage, it's scary, but there's plenty of opportunities to like, do those things that make you get that little feeling of like moving a step forward. Right. Which I think early on in your vlog, you probably felt a lot of. Definitely. Yeah. And I like, I sort of built that in there. Like, uh, you know, I mentioned I was playing five ten at the time before I started making my vlogs and I was doing that for like, I don't know, three years or something. Um, again, very repetitively, but yeah, that's what I was up to. And then when I started making the vids, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to start back at one, two in these videos. First video was at Golden Nugget downtown Las Vegas, and the idea was, all right, if I win, if I if I book a win in this session, I'll move up to one three. If I book a win in that session, I'll move up to two five. And if I lose, I'll move back down to one three. So there, there was like you know literal like progression and storyline right from the start, rather than okay, this is what I'm up to. This is my thing. I'm going to keep doing this every single day. Um, and yeah, you can like build in that that uh, that feel of progression, whether it's like for fun or just naturally or what have you. Real quick, before I forget, if you were going to send somebody to watch one video of yours that's never seen it before, out of all <laughs> your videos, like, where are you going to send them? What is what is the episode that uh, they should see, that they have to see? I, yeah, that's a t that's, I guess it's kind of a tough question because, like, I have my personal favorites, but a lot of time, like, my personal favorites aren't what would... Uh, like have gotten the most views or have grown the channel the most. Um, like the the ones that are personal favorites of mine are, are ones that like showcase a lot of lifestyle stuff. Like the channel is very much known for, you know, like Andrew, the poker player, and he walks through poker hands and shares his poker sessions. Maybe he grabs a beer afterwards, but uh, that's the kind of like very much the meat of, of these videos. Like the the favorites, the personal favorites are like, when I went to uh, South Africa with my wife, Boosie, and captured a bunch of stuff over there. And like, as we, as we were leaving South Africa, I walked through like the trip, you know, and like talked about my favorite parts of the trip as we're going back to the airport. Uh, or like this one in the, from Barcelona, where I, I met somebody. So I got in touch with somebody over there who I'd never met before. He watched, he watches the vids. His name is Sirkan. And you know, I put out, I put it out there. I was like, Hey, I would love for somebody to I have a local to show me around their favorite spots in Barcelona. And so he met this very cool guy, you know, he plays poker a little bit, but that's not what he does. Um, and so he like took me around to his favorite spots in Barcelona. So then like me, like talking about that and sharing those scenes and then back, back to Vegas. And then there, of course, there's like Bellagio in there too. So like videos like that, um, are, are my personal favorites. And there was one, there was one more that, uh, I made with a guy named Paul here in Vegas. We did like this Christmas special. It was like uh, <laughs> it was like a poker vlog meets Dr. Seuss kind of a situation. Uh, so that one was really fun to make. And of course, that was like very different from the usual offerings. Um, so yeah, stuff like that. I don't know. I mean, I guess the easiest thing to do would just be like go to my channel, switch over to the the popular tab is what they they call it. You can see the most watched videos under that tab. Um, and apparently those are the videos that have done the best for my channel. I don't know if those would, I don't know if any of those would be like ones that I would personally recommend really, but you know, it's tough to, tough to know. Okay, I had to make a shift guys. My camera died on me yet again. <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to be staring at you right here, but we're going to make this work. So anyways, when it comes to Andrew's video, I, I agree, man. I think they should go and I think they should watch what, what you like the most. I think those were the most interesting videos. If you go to Andrew's channel and you look at the most popular ones, if I had to guess, it's we're probably talking about the ones with the big pots on the live streams type of things, um, which is cool. And there's like breakdowns and exciting hands, but um, there's really something special, especially especially like some of those older ones where you know, editing that footage into a, a story um, of a of a poker player traveling or or highlighting specific spots. So 
I'd have to uh, agree with you there. Um, let me let me check back in here. Um, so, with <laughs> were there any moments like over the past uh, few years when things were taking off that were notable kind of um, highs for you for this whole venture? What were some of the the lows maybe too when it comes to kind of like you know you went all in on yourself um, and building this ecosystem under the un- umbrella of Andrew Nimi. Um, what were some of the things that were were scary and uh, maybe some of the highlights just you know, if people are thinking about going that entrepreneurial route. It's just, it was really like, uh, um, a lot of it was just like a process of figuring out how to deal with uh, this, this shift, you know, because there's like, if you start making content, I'm sure like at some point in the probably near future, they'll be teaching these things in high school, like how to build a channel, how to deal with an uh, how to interact with an audience and how to deal with trolls and all sorts of things that come along with um, content creation that so many people find uh, that they might find it an interesting endeavor. Um, but yeah, there's just like a lot of like learning on your own and, and figuring out like what your brain uh, react, how your brain reacts to like different things like this. And people, you know, I've seen the, like a bunch of podcasts ever since uh, starting. It's like, yeah, of course, like, you know, they say, you know, ignore the haters, but it's natural for your brain to like focus in on that, uh, that, that 1% or that half percent of people that uh, just have like some real terrible things to say about you. Um, so there's like those, there's like that element to, uh, to the process. Um, there's burnout, you know, burnout was uh, definitely a real thing. And always, I think probably will be, you know, have to manage that, um, do whatever you can to manage that. And that's, that's a process especially as like a poker player, because um, for a couple of reasons, A, you're stacking the competitiveness of poker uh, on top of or underneath um, the creative endeavor that is a a YouTube channel and content creation itself. So like stacking those two things on top of each other, you can, you can definitely burn out. That's a lot to deal with. Um, And then, you know, like playing poker, it's, it it could be kind of tough to maintain a routine. Say you're in like a really good poker game at the, uh, you know, the win 510 game and it's like 2 30 in the morning and you're trying to like maintain a normal person's schedule and you want to get up and have that morning coffee and get the workout in after that and etc can't leave this game it's just too good there's going to be great content that'll come from this the your your roi is going to be too high it's just like not the right move to leave so you know like again managing all these different aspects of this thing it can be a lot and then travel on top of that so we, we came up with this uh this concept called the meetup game which is basically was designed to be a, like a fun event around poker just like a social night of poker because a lot of time poker can can appear very intimidating to uh to an outsider um especially like literally in the casino you walk through uh, some different areas of the casino, like you walk by the craps table and everyone's high fiving each other when the table is running good. Um, but then you go look at the you, you look at the poker room and it looks very serious and quiet and and intimidating. And so, yeah, the idea for these uh, meetup game events was to have it be the opposite of that. Uh, myself and my co-host Brad Owen, who also has a channel that is the most popular channel in poker blogging, um, co-hosting these events, came up with this uh, this concept, and we'd travel all over the country and sometimes we go from one uh one city to the next one directly go home for a little bit go to the next one so adding that on top of all these uh these other endeavors was you know it could be approaching very close to burnout and i would say that those kind of instances were despite everything going relatively well possible low point um high points you know it's like obviously the uh, partnership with world poker tour the uh the lodge down in Austin, Texas with an awesome group uh, that I'm very lucky to be a part of, Um, you know, having these uh, poker awards that they uh, present you with uh, along the way. Um, Just a quick story. Like the first one of those, I was in South Africa with Boosie and I was nominated for two of these awards. Um, So the time shift is obviously very different over there, but went to bed with the awards going on and woke up to find out that like they awarded the channel with both of the awards that I was up for. Um, so that was like very cool moment because again, I was just like, you know, five, 10 player, not, uh, on the level of like, you know, Daniel Negreanu popularity, but this poker blogging thing was very much becoming a thing. 
And so now to like have those two awards be like, oh, this this one person won two of these awards for our industry. That's that's pretty interesting. Uh, so, so yeah, that was like a pretty cool moment. Um, but yeah, lots of uh, lots of stuff along the way. Don't let him fool you, folks. Like at this point, he's somewhat of a Daniel Negreanu himself. Um, <laughs> I, I, I say that in jest, but also it's shifted, right? Like you mentioned, it's it's different now. It's not the ESPN characters. It's the um, relatable grinders um, that are you can see in a casino and you can play with Andrew and play in these meetup games and it's super cool. Um, unique situation if you play poker and you follow some of these guys to be able to go sit down and play some 2-5 with them. Um, so be, before it's... By the way, congrats on everything. Cool story. Love to see where you're at. Um, let's shift a little bit just towards the investing side of things. Like, have you, you know, you have these different income streams now. You have the Lodge, um, you have poker, you have YouTube, you have WPT, you have whatever else you got going on. Um, what has what that allowed you to think about for your personal? kind of investing, trading mindset? Do you have kind of like long-term goals now? Are you really pressing it as you're still young? Um, what have you started to think about when it comes to that type of thing? Yeah, so I, I think I'm just like, I think I'm generally paying attention to different things that are happening, whether that's like in the crypto space or lately, I guess it's in the, how do you get, you know, 5.25% return on your cash kind of stuff that's going on right now. Um, so yeah, I would say, I wouldn't say I'm like pressing it. Um, I am trying to like find, find the, uh, find the edge where I can and do what's right and do what's smart. But I feel like anytime I've really tried to get in the weeds with, with it, whether it's like trading, uh, and trying to like day trade equities or crypto, uh, or what have you, it's basically never really worked out that well. Um, you know, the, the buy and hold strategy for crypto has worked out well. Um, anything that's like trading wise, I, I feel like there's been basically no substantial wins for me personally. I feel like that's, that shouldn't really be that surprising because all these things that I've been talking about so far uh, require so much attention and energy that there's just not a lot left over to really like find that much edge in a uh, shorter time frame, more aggressive uh, strategy. So it's just not really my strong suit. Again, I think it probably comes back to the uh, not not super competitive nature of myself. And also just like what's left over in mind share and energy wise to uh, to devote to something like that. Um, so, you know, I have people uh, that I like pay attention to on Twitter paired that back a bunch and tried to not follow every single crypto guy talking about every single altcoin. And, uh, you know, some, some smarter guys that, uh, that I try and follow along with. Um, my wife and I, she's uh, very much into investing and trading herself. And so we talk about some different things. Um, but yeah, just trying to take, I think, probably like a, I'm sure like the long-term stuff is in there. Long-term view is definitely in there. Um, some midterm stuff which we'll see how long this 5% thing is available for. Uh, that probably falls into that category. But yeah, probably trying to be pretty self-aware in terms of like the real short-term stuff and how it's definitely not my strong suit. Yeah, I mean, when I hear uh, anybody who is not dedicating the full-time grind to figuring it out, to step into the the coliseum that is the equities market and, and battle it out for... Um, for edge is just is tough for professionals, especially in this environment. And so it's, you mentioned like following less people on Twitter, you start to realize that everybody you thought was always right um, can consistently be wrong and that there's so much noise out there and to not just like find your own strategy and grind it day after day to expect to like profit short term is just like, it's just tough. I mean, and it can be done, right? It can be, you can go on a heater in live poker as a questionable player for six months. Um, it could happen. Uh, but, but long term, from what you've said before, it makes a lot of sense that uh, the non-competitive, non-FOMO 
long-term approach seems to be uh, more in your wheelhouse, I guess. And yeah, I would think so. Things that are there these days, it's pretty nuts. The type yeah. of yeah, you can get. Yeah, and I would think so. And I would also say, like, even if these guys that I am following and uh, it, it might not be the case that they're not as smart as I thought they were. It might just be that they have more winners than they do losers, but it's tough for me to, you know, if I'm not taking everything, if I'm not doing everything that they're doing, like if I'm not trading, if I'm not taking all the same trades and I'm only just kind of like dabbling here and there, like, am I going to have that much of an edge? Uh, am I going to be like executing anywhere nearly as good as they are? Am I going to be getting in and out as quickly or as correctly as they are? Um, so it's just tough as like a, a casual observer and occasionally executor of uh, of just like some of their stuff that they're doing when again there's just like all these other things that have so much of my attention so so yeah i think like you know i'm i'm, I'm sure your uh, your theme of uh investing in yourself and really you know doubling and tripling down on yourself and focusing on your strong suits is going to show like such a bigger return of course people can get lucky occasionally but um, you know, that's where I think your, uh, your real competitive edge and your unfair advantages are going to come from. Yeah, that's the whole point. It's still something I'm trying to work on too. You know, it's like, uh, what kind of trader investor am I, who aligns with that? How much can I learn from them? What are they doing? Um, how, how are they finding edge? What types of like assets are even like best suited for that? Right. Like, you know, you can you can like have a certain kind of risk tolerance or whatever. Well, then you shouldn't be trading a, an asset that has a volatility profile over 50, right? You probably want to find the things that are in that lower bucket or vice versa. Like if you're going to, if you're going to trade, like I was going to say bonds, but uh, bonds have been pretty volatile, but if you're going to trade like some really slow moving um, asset class and expect big returns, well, then you're just going to get frustrated with throughout time and end up doing something stupid there too. So kind of al aligning those is, it's not an easy question, but I think that's kind of a, well, it's one of the good reasons that, you know, you're doing what you're doing where you can, you can control some things with, with like the effort you're putting in on your end and the, the, the prospects of business and sponsorship and poker and all that, and then kind of trying to best align, uh, your investments with kind of who you are and what your goals are over time. And then you should in no time be ultra wealthy. No <laughs> easy. It sounds so easy. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. That's all you have to do. Amazing. Um, but yeah, any, uh, any shout outs? Um, I'm going to wrap this up here. Any uh, thing you've been working on, which it's funny. I, I kind of wish that poker Twitter and FinTwit and crypto Twitter all had like this, bucket where they could all go and just terrorize each other because they each are the same thing but with just different players and different characters in the pool i haven't, I haven't yeah it's always it, it, it's always out. interesting it's definitely interesting because like there is the occasional crossover um you know like we got jason mo who came from the poker background and is very well known in crypto now we got keyboard warrior who comes to the lodge and plays on our streams occasionally He's very keyboard. much well known. Keyboard monkey, sorry, keyboard monkey, KBM. Um, and so, yeah, there is this like occasional crossover, and you, find, you you sort of discover, oh wait, you're into this thing. I, I know you from that thing. Um, but yeah, uh, just gonna be up to more vids, more travel, more travel coming up. Uh, where are we off to? We're gonna go to Montreal in October. That should be really cool. Uh, I don't, you've never been to Montreal, have you, James? James been i've been plenty of times i'm from upstate new york so oh that's right that's right I took french so that i could go to montreal and order some frites you know Je you? De frites. actually no that's that's my name is fries so forget that <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> montreal in october for wpt the uh, world championship for the world poker tour is in december 40 million dollar prize pool guarantee for the uh, the championship event so that one is uh, is both record setting and awesome. Um, last year that event was super. Yeah. Might have to try. You should join us. Yeah, there'll be a, there would be a meetup game towards the uh, start of the events. You can join us for that one maybe. Um, but yeah, the uh, the championship event should be 
should be awesome. So that's a really cool event in the winter time. But yeah, just plugging away at this thing, you know, trying to stick to my my uh, my strong suits, not uh, not take too many crypto trades and live a good life. Preach on that one. Okay, guys, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for hanging with us through this episode. Hope you uh, are kind of inspired to see somebody who's really kind of dove into building a personal brand and really seeing how it can flourish in different ways that you would never never expect. And he's a pretty good poker player in his own right. So what? So I, so I hear. WPT. I have my, I have my moments. <laughs> All right, Andrew. Thank you. Have a great day, and uh, we'll chat soon. See you for episode thanks. five. Thanks, James.